So I wanted to start off by telling a story about why I'm standing in front of you talking about self-care. Last year was my junior year here at Denison University and I got off to a really promising start. Wonderful classes, wonderful co-curricular opportunities, as Denison offers, always. About halfway through my first semester, however, I started to struggle. I was really, really struggling to get out of bed. When I was out of bed, I was exhausted, I was fatigued, and I was distancing myself from things that I truly cared about. When I was hit with fatigue and exhaustion, I thought that it was something with my body because that's the way we're taught to think about health, right? That it's our bodies. After a few blood tests, I realized that that wasn't it, that it was a problem with my holistic well-being. I struggled just to say that it was something with my mind because I think that that silences the connection that our minds and our bodies have. We're taught to think of them as separate. To me, it was holistic well-being that was off. So I decided to make some changes in my life and I really worked to make sure that I was taking care of myself. It was revolutionary. The ways in which I took care of myself that I hadn't been doing before were the ways that I came into healing and I got back to 100%. It was an incredible process. One that I wish I could give as a gift to everyone in this room. So I wanted to talk a little bit about why these things matter so much to me and why I think that they're revolutionary. I wanted to start off with a quote. It's by Audre Lord, and it says, caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. This quote means a lot to me for a lot of reasons. But the first is that it tells us that taking care of yourself is not indulgence, it's a necessity. And even further, it's an act of political warfare. I define self-care as a sustained and intentional practice in one's life to preserve wellness and maintain a wholeness in being. For me, this means your holistic well-being is intact. But sometimes I struggle to explain this, so I thought I'd show you a picture if you've ever been on a plane, this is in your seat back pocket. And it's a woman using her oxygen mask before she helps the child next to her. When I was younger, I saw this picture and I said, why isn't she helping the child first? He's in need, right? As I got older, I realized that the oxygen mask is a lot like self-care. We all have parents, friends, family members that we want to be empathetic towards. But if we don't take care of ourselves, if we don't put on the oxygen mask first, we don't have the capacity to help those people that we care so much about. To me, this is a revolutionary idea. It tells us that it's not selfish, it's necessary to take care of yourself. <clears throat> so why, is it, why am I making the jump to say that it's revolutionary? Because a revolution is an active and fundamental shift in power. I believe self-care is a shift in power from institutions, from other people, to the individual. When I talk about institutions, these aren't on the whole negative, right? You think about your professors, families, friends, other people in your life. But these people are often influencing our perceptions of ourselves more than we are. Achievement-based schooling gives us the thought process that we need to do well with numbers in order to do well as humans. Self-care takes that power away from those institutions and gives it to the individual, which is why I think it's revolutionary. So I want to talk about some of the practices that I've implemented into my life to make self-care such a huge priority. I'm still struggling, we all are, but these are some three ways that I've made my life a lot easier through self-care. The first is eliminating shame and guilt, what I call negative self-talk. We're taught to be shameful about our bodies. We're taught to be guilty about the ways that we use them. We're taught to feel shame when we go out or we don't go out. It's kind of a human thing. But eliminating the way, as creatures, we think about shame and guilt is the first step to taking care of yourself. Once I stopped feeling shameful about not feeling 100%, I got a lot better. The second is practicing rituals of self-care. There are two that are really important to me, but there are so many other options for students and people who want to take care of themselves. For me, my first act and my first ritual was writing. It was the way that I processed my emotions, it was the way that I let out a lot of feelings, and it was incredibly revolutionary. The second was spending time with my community. I often say that my community is my spirituality, which means that the ways in which I spend time with people that make me feel whole and safe, those are revolutionary acts of self-care. But that's not it. A 30-minute walk every day is the same effectiveness as an antidepressant. And also leisure. I think that, we, that leisure as a concept is completely underrated. 
Taking time to do something that's intentionally not on your to-do list is powerful in taking care of yourself. It's absolutely a revolution of self-care. And the third practice is choosing optimism. I learned about this from some of my friends who are also activists. If you identify as an activist, you wake up every morning feeling like your humanity is tied to that of others. The problem with that is watching the news can sometimes be discouraging. Choosing optimism is noting that 24 hours of every day is not all bad, that there are positive things to pick out in each day, and that every human is a ball of untapped potential. That is choosing optimism to me, and it's the third way that I've implemented self-care in my life. So we eliminate self-talk, we start practicing rituals of self-care, and we choose optimism. I would hope that we all can do that. But the struggle is, how do we implement that so our young people can do the same? I had all these really revolutionary things, but I didn't hear about them until like my sophomore or junior year in higher education. I think that students who learn to advocate for themselves, to preserve themselves early on, those are gonna be the real power kids. I have a vision that I'd like to share with you all. My vision is a world where all of our young people are empowered to practice self-care. This is tough to implement right away. It's a lofty vision, but I have a couple ideas as to how this could work. I was very lucky to work at an organization called Amoja Student Development Corporation back home in Chicago over this past summer. The organization implements socio-emotional learning practices in the classroom in a period called advisory, which happens once every week. They work with students on college access, they work with them on leadership development. They tell them that their potential is untapped and they have a lot to offer the world. Sounds like self-care to me. I could see the first week talking about things that are positive in people's lives, writing them down in a post-it and putting them in a jar. The second week talking about values. As you get more comfortable in the advisory period, you can start talking about more serious ways in which to practice self-care, including mental health and how to take care of your body. I could see this working pretty well in the socio-emotional learning model, and that's why I wanted to tell you all about it today. My hope is that students like me are given the tools to be foreign or to be fluent in the language of self before they learn a foreign language. My hope is that our students will leave with an idea that self-care is not simply indulgent, it's necessary, and even further, it's an act of revolution. Thank you. Yeah.